I'm joined today by Dixon Despamier, Professor Emeritus of Microbiology and Public Health at Columbia University. He's recently been working on uh, or has has become more known for his thoughts on vertical farming after conceiving of the urban farm skyscraper. <clears throat> it's so great to have you on. Uh, let's start for people who may not be familiar with this concept. We've talked about it a little bit, but not extensively. What are we talking about when we say vertical farming and urban farming? Sure. Well, first of all, let me say that it's a pleasure to be on your show. And um, so let's start with the concept that everybody is familiar with, namely a greenhouse. So if I were to say, imagine a greenhouse that's two stories tall, people would have no trouble with that whatsoever. So that's basically what I consider to be a, a vertical farm. Anything that's more than a single story tall, even if it doesn't have separations of floors inside that particular building, like an old warehouse, as long as you're growing food inside and it's larger than a greenhouse, that's, that's a vertical farm. Okay, so we then have to move on and discuss the importance of the urban <laughs> word in this, right? And this is a, a big part of when we talk about- that's right energy consumption, sustainability, why you believe that this is a, is a great path forward. What's the importance of these being located in urban areas? Right. Well, well, first of all, there's a huge push towards urbanization if you look around the world, and it's, it's occurring for various reasons, mostly in South Asia and Southeast Asia and China. It's occurring because of climate change issues that has uh, adversely affected outdoor farming. And so a lot of outdoor farms have failed, and there are a lot of people associated with those farms, and in and, and lack of something better to do, they, they move to the city looking for work. So that's a, that's a major, major problem in some places. Uh, another reason to move to the city, of course, is that's where all the social services are, that's where your relatives live, it's where the restaurants are, where the theaters are, where your, where your new home is. Uh, you know, we're making cities in some places more livable so that it's attracting people uh, for that reason as well. But, but mostly, I would say, for most of the world, uh, that is not our developed world, but mostly the developing world, it's, uh, it's under duress that people are moving to cities. So make the sort of broad case as to why this type of farming mechanism or apparatus would overall be more sustainable than what we have now? Is it, is it an energy consumption play? Is it a distance needed to travel for the food once grown? What, what's the best sort of entryway into thinking about the logistics of that? Sure. Um, well, if I were to draw parallels between outdoor and indoor farming, uh, of course you'd have to bring up the, uh, the issue of energy and because all the plants outdoors get their energy from the sun, uh, it makes indoor farming look pretty excessive with regards to energy expenditures. But if you look at the amount of fossil fuels that is burned in order to plow, plant, harvest, store, ship, refrigerate, etc., in the United States at least, 20% of the fossil fuels that is consumed in this country is used for farming or related activities. So getting food to market is a huge problem also, although we're not too concerned about food miles as, as, as a consumer of energy, but we are worried about what shape the food is in when you harvest it before it's ripe, you package it, and then you send it to some long distance place like say from California to New York City. Uh, you get a lot of damage of produce. Um, some is better than others, so people will buy the good-looking tomatoes and reject the ones that are bruised, for instance. You get a lot of loss of food on the way. and. Um, so for se for several reasons, uh, it's more it makes more good sense to just put the food closer to where, where most of the people live. So I think urban farming has some huge advantages in that respect. So this is uh, obviously when people hear you talk about this, this this sounds fantastic, and we've talked about the potential benefits of this uh, for for the last couple of years. But these ideas are not without critique. And in fact, if people search for your name on the Internet, they'll find uh, all sorts <laughs> of people who seem very eager to criticize your idea of vertical urban farms. Right. Let's sort of get into the critiques generally, and then we can drill down more specifically. The general sure. critique and most common one that I find is that your idea seems focused on productivity per land area. So you can imagine if you have a 50 foot tall building, and you look at the land area that that building consumes, it's very small and you would get a lot of food productivity because you're building up 50 feet and that sort of makes sense. And the criticism is if you actually look at 
food productivity per energy usage, given the the indoor uh, lighting and and irrigation that would be necessary, that the usage uh -huh. would far outweigh any savings from having the food grown closer to the population center. I'm sure this is not the first time you're hearing this critique of your idea. <laughs> of course uh, not. What's your response? Well, I would uh, just go back to the last thing I said. You 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 expend a huge amount of energy that has nothing to do with growing the plants per se. That is to say, sure, the sunlight is free, but the energy that you spend in order to make those crops happen outdoors is huge. So none of those critics actually do a careful analysis of if we could grow the same amount of food indoors, how much real consumption, let's say, in terms of fossil fuel use, would indoor farming be compared to outdoor farming? And so no one's ever uh, purposefully put forth that hypothesis as a way of really carefully examining this. And by the way, the amount of energy, I, I almost agreed with the critics when I first suggested this because mm -hmm. I knew that indoor lighting was expensive and um, not expensive to uh, run necessarily, but certainly expensive to buy. Uh, it was very hard to find the proper lighting sources and things like this. This was about 10 years ago. Um, if you look at the advances in what has happened since then for LED lights alone, it has gone from some 20% efficiency to 60% efficient use of electricity, which is an enormous savings. That's uh, you know unheard of in terms of technological developments for, let's say, plasma screen televisions or you know, hybrid cars and things of this sort. Uh, the LED industry has truly come up to speed with regards to the needs of reducing the energy consumption of indoor lighting to make it feasible to do it anywhere. But let me just also say that when I first heard these critiques about energy use, I said, well, people living in Iceland wouldn't care about that. People living in Italy wouldn't care about that. People living in the North Island of New Zealand wouldn't care about that. People living in the southwestern portion of the United States wouldn't care about that because in those situations, you've got all the geothermal energy you could possibly use and you can harness that and make electricity essentially because the earth is still cooking inside of its uh, inner core that provides that energy, so to speak. So in you've other got, words, if, if the L you're not necessarily denying that the energy consumption for the indoor lighting m might be significantly more than than sunlight but you're saying if we can transition to renewable sources for that electricity then it becomes sort of irrelevant that's right uh and that's happening by the way and in fact most of the high-tech greenhouses that uh, sort of pave the way for the vertical farm revolution, if I can call it that, um, now employ solar panels and uh, geothermal energy to offset the cost of, of their indoor lighting because they want to farm 24 hours a day, uh, 360 days of the year. And in order to do that, you've got to use grow lights. And and so you have to find a, a, a more passive energy capture way of doing it that doesn't put a strain on the pocketbook of uh, the consumer. And Frankly, the, the crops that they're growing are at the same price point as the crops that are being grown outdoors. And by the way, I'm sure you've all noticed the price of your food is going up. Uh, outdoor grown food is becoming very difficult to produce because of these climate change issues. And even in the United States, California, which pr provides over a quarter of the fresh produce for this whole country, is in its fifth year of a drought that doesn't look like there's an end in sight. At least they can't see one. So when you've got those kinds of situations pressing at your doorstep, the wolf of energy, so to speak, seems rather small in terms of the other environmental issues that farmers are having to face right now. I'd love to drill down a little bit more specifically on types of food and a lot of the sort of experiments or early attempts at this that we've seen, including some in Japan, have focused pretty heavily on lettuce and greens. And there yep. there's sort of another line of critique, which is this may work better for salad, different types of salad and greens, etc. But when you look at fruits and grains and nuts, the energy consumption, the water and light required goes up significantly so. And when we compare, for example, salad, which is incredi incredibly uh, sparse, it has a low nutrient density versus uh, almonds, for example, which have very high nutrient density, that on a nutrient density basis, this becomes more complex when you move towards things like grains, nuts and, and fruits. What do you think about that? It's a non-argument because um, I can already tell you that there's a 
there's a shopping list of food items that you can buy commercially right now that are being grown indoors <clears throat> that would astound the critics if they were to just do a little work. Uh, there's what are no, some of those that might surprise our audience? Oh, tomatoes, uh, potatoes rather, um, radishes, um, rutabaga. I, mean, I can give you, a, I mean, I don't have the list directly in front of me, but I have carrots. Carrots, radishes, uh, there are no root vegetables that, are, uh, that can't be grown indoors. Uh, I agree with the grains, by the way. The grains have an issue because uh, they, they're grasses, okay? They're totally different than any other plant that we grow. And so those are tougher to grow to confluence in an indoor setting. And uh, that's an issue that's being addressed right now by the experimental vertical farmers that, uh, that are at the universities and places like Monsanto, I'm sure that they are working on this night and day because they see this as an advantage hmm. uh, as, as to what they can do. Nuts, on the other hand, they grow on trees, don't they? I would never suggest putting a tree indoors. Trees sequester carbon, and I think that's a good thing. So leave them outside. Bush fruits, however, you know, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, all those uh, edibles, they're all being grown now commercially indoors. So even though they're not being sold in many places uh, like that, and don't forget the tomatoes also, it's, it's, it is mostly about the, the leafy greens though, because these places that are startups, they have to make a profit right away in order to offset their costs of development. And indeed, that's, that's what they've gone for. They've gone for the high price spreads, but I already know that there are five or six uh, vertical farm situations uh, owners of which that are thinking about plant diversity. So a one-stop shop, before you go home, you can get most of your vegetable needs at the vertical farm uh, grocer. Um, and you can buy your chicken from somebody else. And perhaps the tilapia you could also buy from the, the from farmers if they employ aquaculture. So uh, it's an early stage of this industry. And I think it's uh, too early to criticize whether you can fly from New York to Paris, for instance, without stopping, uh, as they did with the early flights, of course, for airplanes. I think vertical farming finds itself at the at the uh, the U.S. mail delivery system of the development of the airplane. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and I'm sure that there are people that uh, will always throw stones at glass houses, and <laughs> in this case, it's a two-story vertical farm that they're throwing stones at, but uh, if you make them out of bulletproof glass, I think you'll be in good shape. Well, it is no doubt fascinating. We've been speaking with Dixon Despamier, Professor Emeritus of Microbiology and Public Health at Columbia University. Uh, thanks so much for talking to us about this. Pleasure. Anytime.